So this purple tomato, it's genetically engineered, meaning it now has genes from the snapdragon flower. And the purpose was to create, to force the tomato to make high levels of anthocyanins. Okay, now anthocyanins, you probably heard about, these are compounds that give blueberries and blackberries and eggplant and purple cabbage, they give it that purple color, right? The anthocyanins are often called like, um, they're, they're an antioxidant. And we think of them included in foods that are called superfoods. And that's because we think of antioxidants as neutralizing reactive oxygen species, right? Or these compounds in the body that can cause damage to cells and that have been associated with chronic and autoimmune diseases, right? So there's all this hype about, we gotta get enough antioxidants in our diet. And so they created this genetically modified tomato so that it would, it has the genes now from the snapdragon flower to be able to transcribe and translate, basically produce high levels of anthocyanins within this purple tomato. Okay, so the scientist who actually came up with this idea um, is Kathy Martin. And she's a, bio, um, a biochemist from trained at the University of Cambridge. And the way she created it was she started with this basic technique that was actually figured out in the 1980s. And that's where you can use bacteria to insert DNA into a host organism. So what she did was she isolated the genes for the snapdragon flower. Um, and you can put those genes into a bacteria, like a plasmid, and then that can actually get, um, that foreign genetic material can actually get into the tomato genome itself. And the tomato will then start expressing those genes. Okay, so this does involve um, it, it did involve, um, bacteria. So, you know, in, in some of the documents I'm going to show you, there is also a potential for antibiotic resistance, right? Because of the way that they actually produce these, um, genetically modified crops. Um, and it did involve taking genes from another species, right? A flower that is now put into a tomato. So in other words, what I'm saying is something that would not happen in nature. Right, you're not crossing two different types of tomatoes together, like we've done now for a long time. You're this, actually this taking is not, this is not Mendel's peas. Yes, yes, yes. We're not talking about Mendel anymore, like Gregor Mendel. Yeah, um, not not only not only would this not happen in nature, but nature has a lot of uh, bar barriers to make right. this not able to happen. That's right. That's right. So. Um, I saw a quote from the CEO of um, the company that's doing this is Norfolk and Norfolk Sciences and the U.S. Um, subsidiary is called is Norfolk Healthy Produce, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Norfolk Healthy Produce. And their CEO was quoted as saying, it really is a great example of understanding how the natural world functions and building on that to meet our needs. Right. So how the natural world functions, which is to me, that's not, this is not how the natural world, world functions, right? A tomato is not going to be crossing with a snapdragon flower, but then it's the second part building on that to meet our needs. So this goes into what you were saying earlier. What's the motive here? So when he says meet our needs, right? The, if, at first blush, you can think, oh, okay, so maybe that means to meet our needs if we want more um, anthocyanins in our diet, right? But here's the thing. We already have tomatoes that are not genetically modified that have anthocyanin levels that are higher, right? There's um, it, called an indigo family. And this was bred by Jim Myers. He's a plant breeder and professor at Oregon State University. And he did this, you know, the hybrid, right? You're crossing the genes from wild tomato and modern tomato varieties um, to produce this indigo family of tomatoes with higher anthocyanin levels. And the reason he did that is because, so our domesticated tomatoes, generally speaking, will have anthocyanins predominantly in the stems and the leaves. But if you look at wild tomatoes, they'll have anthocyanins in the fruit, Right, which exact that's exactly what this genetically modified purple tomato is touting, 
is that, oh, the anthocyanins are not just in the skin. It goes all the way through the fruit. Look, it's purple all the way through and through this tomato. But some wild tomatoes are already doing that, right? Naturally, they already do that naturally. And this guy, Jim Myers, um, create hybridized, uh, you know, he crossed these tomato species and has already come up with tomatoes, actually 50 cultivars of the indigo tomato um, that's been around for a couple decades now. So you can already get these on the market without being genetically modified. There's also heirloom varieties or purple tomatoes that are available, like black zebra, black beauty, whatnot. So why are they creating this genetically modified version of this purple tomato? So one, one potential reason, right? We're, we're now guessing, right? Because we're trying to understand their motives. One potential reason is it's patented, right? Kathy Martin, Norfolk Plant Sciences and their colleagues, they have patents on this, right? So, which means there's money involved, right? Always follow the money. Another theme of this program. But there's another, another potential motive. And this fits into the quote from the CEO of, we're going to build on this to meet our needs. Okay. So as we mentioned, they have shifted their advertising. And if you go onto their website, I'm going to read you a couple of the headlines. They promote some headlines from um, different publications talking about this purple tomato. So here's just some of the head headlines. Behold, the purple tomato, a new designer super fruit. Um, they have um, learning to love GMOs. This company's GMO will help feed the world by being eaten. <laughs> right? um, so some of these are um, some of these are I wanted to really point out because, like the New York Times one, learning to love GMOs. That fits into what I think part of the motive is here. So they're saying that if you read in the documentation from this company, they're saying that people are deficient in antioxidants, okay? And look, as a scientist and someone who helps people reverse chronic and autoimmune diseases, I can I actually relate to that. I can understand that. And you and I have talked about this and people in our circles have talked about how our food is less nutrient dense now, generally speaking, than it was in the past, right? All sorts of issues um, contribute to that, uh, like the use of glyphosate, that's a key later, that also you know can disrupt the microbiome of the plant, um, eroding the topsoil, right? With all kinds of contributing factors have resulted in less nutrient density in our food supply. So I can understand that, right? And what they're what they're saying is that. We need to put these antioxidants in something like a tomato, which is um, consumed at higher quantities than something like a blueberry or a blackberry, right? Or a red cabbage. So hmm. we need to put it in something that's consumed by a large quantity of people so that we boost their antioxidant level. Okay. And so like I'm saying, I, I can get behind that in, in the sense that, yes, I think it would be great for people to consume more antioxidants, right? But there's all these caveats to this, okay? Um, for one, if they really wanted to help people, like if they really wanted to change the way people are gonna eat, then since they're already trying to control what people eat, right? Wouldn't you think a better way would be to get them to stop eating the processed foods? Like this is the big problem. Right. Like, why aren't they still, why aren't they lobbying against processed foods instead of trying to change a food, like changing the genes of a food um, and, and trying to get us kind, kind of trying to sneak it in to the diet. Right. Um, they would shut down food processing companies or they would lobby to stop giving preferential treatment to those large corporations that even the CDC says are hurting our health. Right. And instead help the small farmer but they're not. So what's the motive? Thank you for joining us on Beyond Labels. Our mission with this podcast is to make it accessible to everyone. But we are behind a paywall because the issues we discuss are often subject to censorship. We run into that. And so we have an extremely modest paywall to let us have the freedom to discuss the kind of issues we want to discuss in the way we want to discuss them. And you can become a member 
and enjoy all this content by clicking on the description box below. We look forward to having you join our family.